my name is Dr. Evan. My name is Dr. Evan Torner, and it's my delight and pleasure to uh, host the keynote um, number two, uh, which is Dr. Jessica Hammer. And I'm just going to read a uh, short bio of my own creation <laughs> on on Dr. Hammer because uh, you know I. I think she deserves it. And uh, we'll first start with the, the basic details. Um, she is director of the Center for Transformational Play at Carnegie Mellon and uh, Thomas and Lydia Moran, Associate Professor of Learning Science at, um, in the Human Computer Interaction Institute and Entertainment Technology Center, again, at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a... Um, a great opportunity to hear from somebody who is at the intersection of, you know, Jewish identity, socially progressive politics, uh, learning science, and computer science, and, and, and it's at the uh, sort of where transformational play is happening and transformational design. A few noted products from Jessica Hammer's uh, background. One is a game called Rosenstrasse developed with Mo Turkington that was just nominated for a Diana Jones Award and is about, you know, the experience of uh, Jewish families uh, during Nazi Germany. Uh, there, and another actually not so well-known project, but one called Girl Effect, uh, which is sponsored by the Nike Foundation uh, with Ethiopian teenagers. Uh, is one one that I, I quite admire trying to, to make simple analog games that still build community. And I just read uh, the other day her text in Manishtana, Why Is This Night Different? Uh, by Gabrielle Rabinovitz and, and Ben Bisogno. And I also had the personal pleasure of being in a Nobilis session that she ran about a decade ago uh, and, and know that she's also an excellent game master. So without any further ado, I present to you uh, Jessica Hammer, Carnegie Mellon University and the title on Jewish Joy. Okay. Thank you so much, Evan, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm really grateful to be here today. and. Um, it's actually a, a little bit of a strange day for me to be speaking about this topic uh, because it's moving towards sunset here in Pittsburgh. And when the sun sets, it's actually going to be uh, Tisha B'Av, which is the Jewish day of mourning. And it's a day of mourning that encompasses uh, a long sort of deep time view of our history. So among the things that we mourn starting tonight, or if, we're, if it's sunset wherever you are, then it has already begun for you, are, for example, the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, the defeat of Bar Kokhba, a revolutionary trying to resist um, imperial Roman impression, uh, oppression, uh, 1096 CE, the beginning of mass murder by crusaders of Jewish communities across Europe, uh, this was uh, associated with the First Crusade, and it went on for well, basically as long as there were Crusades. In 1492, the Spanish expulsion, forced conversions, and uh, murder of Jews who did not comply. In 1943, the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. So you can see that there is this sense of historical mourning that is happening starting in just a couple of hours. But one of the things that I find myself saying when I think about this sort of engagement, long engagement with Jewish history is that Jewish continuity is a form of resistance that despite these terrible events, we are still here to mourn them. And even the mourning is a sign that the these tragedies did not destroy us and we are still here. I wanna give a little bit of context to this, <laughs> this statement because um, not all Jews are the same. I uh, grew up in an Orthodox Jewish community, um, quite a conservative little C, you might say. Um, I sometimes joke that I grew up in 18th century Poland uh, as an adult, I've joined the egalitarian conservative movement. That's big C. It is not actually particularly conservative. 
I come from a Holocaust family. Uh, on one side, my family was decimated by the Holocaust. On the other, my relatives escaped just in time and my grandfather actually fought to liberate the Jews of Europe, including those survivors on my father's side. And I live in Pittsburgh, which uh, as I'm sure you know, experienced a uh, anti-Semitic terror attack in 2018. And in the wake of that attack, I found myself not just saying Jewish continuity is resistance, but the Jewish joy is resistance. That there is sort of, a, that it is not just about recognizing Jewish survival, but about embracing and enjoying the experience of survival. And that has been an important concept to me that is sort of what I wanted to talk about as the theme for today. Um, this, I went and took a look at this. What you're looking at here is a, a, a me, a, one of my favorite memes. Someone made a spreadsheet of Jewish holidays and marked 50% of Jewish holidays celebrate they tried to kill us. 77% we're alive, 50% let's eat. And Judaism is uh, in many ways still, uh, it's linked to the land and, and agricultural religion. So we got 37% trees. And um, looking at this chart and thinking about the relationships between these concepts, right? It's phrased in sort of a comic way, but the argument that I think that these numbers are making is Jewish continuity is resistance, but also joy the natural world. We uh, act in community together. And there are concepts that recognize the important role of um, these elements in how we celebrate. So for example, there's the concept of kidur, which means beautification. And this is sort of um, the idea that when we do something that is religious or ritual, we want to do it beautifully. In this case, what you're looking at are some, you know, religious objects, right? A candlestick um, and uh, what I think is a, um, uh, a spice container that are beautiful. And that beauty, that pleasure is part of the holiness of working with them. There's the concept of oneg, right? Of enjoyment. Uh, and oneg means like, let's do things that are fun for us right now. Let's have some delicious challah as in this picture. And there's the concept of simcha, rejoicing, doing joyful things together in community. So you might sing communally, eat communally, dance communally. And that these are three different ways of not just recognizing Jewish survival, right? But celebrating it over the course of thousands of years. As a game designer, I wanted to particularly point to playfulness. Um, so there are different kinds of playfulness in Judaism. The pur the holiday of Purim, it's our um, uh, holiday of costume rate. The Jews, uh, let's see, they tried to kill us. Uh, we survived, let's eat, but no trees. Uh, and uh, it's a very sort of playful and fun holiday. And one of the ways this playfulness manifests is actually taking religious texts and making them comic, playful, and, and, and using these tropes of Jewishness to, to, to make comedy. So what you're seeing here is a page of Talmud. This happens to be the first page of the Babylonian Talmud, which is a core religious text. It's, um, the Talmud is fascinating. I could give a whole talk on that as an inspiration for game design. It's a mashup of case law, um, funny stories, things that the rabbis happened to think of because something they were said reminded them of it. Um, uh, philosophy, you name it, it's in there. And uh, the, uh, the central structure is the Talmudic text. And then there's commentaries around it. Uh, if we had more time, I could go into some of the language uh, that makes this sort of particularly Talmudic, 
What I really want to show you is here on the left. This is a modern Purim Torah parody about the coronavirus pandemic that is um, using Talmudic language and format. Like you can see quite literally the pages look the same to, to um, talk about the laws of wearing masks using these Jewish tropes and ideas. And Purim is a time where we do that. There are a lot of these examples of Purim Torah. This is what they call it. I actually, I deliberately chose to show you one that is about the pandemic because I think it captures that notion of joy and trauma linking together, celebrating our survival. Um, and in the case of the pandemic, right? Not just Jewish survival, but the sur everyone who is alive celebrating with joy to be continuing on this earth. Um, I wanted to give you a second example. Pesach, they tried to kill us. Let's eat, but not bread. Um, uh, we survive, let's eat, not bread. Uh, also trees, it's an agricultural holiday. Um, and there's some wonderful playfulness in this holiday as well, um, even though it is not sort of the party holiday that Purim is. Uh, there's a part of the Seder that I wanted to highlight as an example of this kind of playfulness, which is um, uh, the rabbis are arguing. And Rabbi Yossi Haglili says, oh, I, I can prove that the, there were 10 plagues in Egypt, but at the Red Sea, they had 50 plagues. He's playing with language here, right? 10 plagues are the finger of God. 50 plagues are the hand of God, right? Five fingers. So playing with the text of the story of the 10 plagues in this way. Well, next along comes Rabbi Eliezer. And Rabbi Eliezer says, oh yeah, well, I can prove there were 40 plagues in Egypt and 200 plagues at the Red Sea, right? It's this game of textual one upery And Rabbi Akiva comes along and says, oh, you say, you say 40 and 200. I can find 50 plagues and 250 plagues. And there's you know, textual analysis going on here to support this. This isn't just their opinion, but the, the, the point of this exchange is that they are engaging with this text in this playful one-upping kind of way. But um, as I was writing this talk, what I found myself struggling with is that um, it is hard if you are not immersed in Jewish culture to recognize Jewish joy. And I want to introduce some key concepts for why I think that's the case. First, I want to introduce the idea of Christian hegemony. You probably uh, may have heard of other kinds of hegemony, like white supremacy, for example, um, but Christian hegemony are social structures that reinforce Christian power and Christian values. Christian hegemony does not have to be explicitly religious or involve Jesus, for example, um, but things like the structure of time, the structure of the year, how people conceive their relationship to nature, how people conceive their relationship to work. These are all structures that in the West at the very least are influenced and perpetuate the dominance of Christianity. The second concept that I want to introduce is the Great Commission which is a uh, Christian concept that says everyone in the world should become Christian, like it or not. And that is a, um, uh, a religious charge, right? This, is, this idea is what's behind, for example, missionary work, proselytizing, evangelizing, attempts to put Christian law into state law so that everyone must live as Christians do. Um, and then finally, and the Great Commission, sorry, I'll just add, uh, it is relevant for everyone, right? If you are not a Christian, guess what? You are a target to become a Christian. Uh, but uh, their Jews have a special place, uh, which is a special concept that applies to us, which is the idea of supersessionism. 
which is the Christian belief that they have replaced Jews in the world and in God's eyes, right? And it turns out that when you take these three concepts together, there are some pretty uncomfortable consequences for Jews. For example, if Christians are the real Jews, then Christians, things that are Jewish are, are for Christians, right? Like, you know, if, if um, uh, it, 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 you know, the, using the word appropriation would not is not even relevant under this idea of uh, supersessionism because it's it, it, it it's theirs now. It doesn't belong to us. There's the idea of Jewish erasure, right? Like we need to try to erase evidence of Jewishness and in this case other cultures as well, right? We need to they shouldn't exist, so let's pretend they don't. Let's not make room for them. Um. But if Jews must exist, let's make sure they do it somewhere else, right? And there has been a long history. Of, we mourn many Jewish exiles today, not just the uh, example from Spain. I see in um, uh, Discord, someone has mentioned the expulsion from England in 1290, right? I mean, long list. Um, and finally, it's uh, it, genocide, right? oh, well, it's our responsibility. It, it, Jews are no longer necessary in the world. Let's make sure there are no more Jews. So these are some pretty unpleasant material consequences of the intersection of Christian hegemony, the Great Commission, and supersessionism. But there's also challenges that this introduces for Jewish games. And I want to talk about three of those challenges today. Um, and these challenges come about, again, from this intersection of these three key concepts. One of them is the idea that Judaism must be reduced to a religion in the same way that Christianity is only a religion. Um, this is because how else are you going to say these two things are equivalent, right? Christianity is a religion, Judaism is a religion, great. So let's just switch from one to the other, no problem. Um, this is not actually what Judaism is. We are an ethno-religion, which is a fancy way of saying we are people, a, tr a tribe. Um, and that um, belief is not central to being a Jew. So, so people cannot find it very difficult to understand when I say, you know, they're, they're, that being atheist or being agnostic and fully Jewish, these are not opposing concepts because the model of belief being central is Christian and other religions, but in this case, we are talking about Christianity. And finally, we are closed tradition, right? So how, because Judaism is for Jews, right? We don't evangelize, we don't proselytize, and we also don't want other people taking our stuff, right? It's, it's ours. So how do we go about making games that incorporate the religious elements of Judaism without inviting these misunderstandings? Um, in particular, uh, the idea that um, if you don't practice in certain ways that your Judaism does not deserve to be taken seriously. And I wanna highlight a game that I think does this really well responding to this challenge which is Manish Tana, Evan mentioned it in my introduction. I wrote an introduction for the game, I wrote a piece for the game because I think it's so excellent. And what Manish Tana does is it actually uses elements of the Seder as game design, but it remixes them. So that if someone is participating in the game, there is a legitimate way for them to participate without replicating Jewish ritual, right? It's not, oh, I'm, uh, you know, a, uh, Christian community, uh, and me and my friends are now running a Seder, but rather they can engage with the key concepts of the Seder without actually carrying out the ritual. And that remixing is really powerful. The other thing that Manishtana does, and, and uh, I'm gonna be talking about several problems here, so I'm not gonna go as deep in any of these games, but I see in Discord, people are posting links and these are awesome games that you should look at because um, I think they're all doing really exemplary things, they have this idea of backdrops that by backdrops mean taking this, this Exodus story and putting it in other settings, 
other times, other places, fantasy, science fiction. And one of the things that that accomplishes is it shows ways of being Jewish while taking the explicit Jewish practice out of it, right? Are you literally Moses? You are not literally Moses, right? But you are still Moses in a Jewish sense in this other setting. So there's some really powerful responses to making Jewish games under Christian hegemony here in Manishtana. A second problem that I want to introduce is the reduction to surface features. And um, by that, I mean that I sometimes call this the Bubby's Bobka and Bagels problem. Um, that how do you, uh, uh, that, that the only signifiers of Jewishness that are sort of intelligible to an outside audience are things that are kind of stereotypical. And this is, this is the problem, right? So first of all, you can be Jewish and never eat a bagel, right? I mean, bagels are delicious. You should eat a bagel, but um, it's not necessary and you should not have to do those things to be recognizable and interpretable as a Jew making Jewish games. It also doesn't capture Jewish diversity. So there are different um, cultural traditions within Judaism. Uh, what we, Ashkenazi Juda Jews, Judaism is a tradition that typically comes from Western Europe. And what we think of as the surface features of Judaism are in fact Ashkin normative, that um, it assumes that the way of being Jewish is to be a Jew whose roots are in Western and Central Europe, while in fact, there are Jews from all over the world, right? Jachnun is just as Jewish as bagels are. Um, but it doesn't receive the same sort of interpretability and attention from people who are trying from, it, it doesn't read, it's, it's hard to make read, right, to people who are outside of Judaism. And it also flattens Jewish difference, right? Oh, well, Jews are just Christians with no Jesus and bagels, um, right? You can see how that's in the interests of supersessionist thinking and uh, missionary thinking. And one of the things that I wanna sort of get into in this talk a little bit is how that superficial approach is, is, does not do justice to what we are. Um, and again, I wanna to point to a game that I think handles this really well, um, Dream Apart um, by uh, 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 Benjamin Rosenbaum is, actually using some of these signifiers, right? It's a, it, in the title of the game, right? Jewish fantasy of the shtetl. And um, the, uh, uh, it's not trying to universalize an experience of Judaism, right? It is saying this story and these symbols are, un are representative of these Jews in this time and this place. And the other thing that it does that I think is really powerful is that that time and place is less factual than it participates in a Jewish literary and artistic tradition that you also see, for example, in the works of Marc Chagall, um, that you see in the stories of Shalom Aleichem, that it's engaging with the mythic shtetl as a way of addressing this problem of Jews being reduced to the most stereotyped surface features. I'm not even getting into the negative stereotypes, right? Just like, you know, the, the, the bagels and black hats. So again, another game that I think is worth looking at outside of this talk and uh, maybe finding a group to play. The third challenge is the one that I personally grapple with the most in my work is reducing Jews to Jewish suffering. And the reason why um, this is sort of a piece of supersessionist thinking is, uh, that first of all, Jews must be sad since they don't have Jesus and therefore we are right to force them to not be Jews anymore. Um, but the challenge is that it's actually partly true, right? I gave just a few examples of Jewish exile, genocide, persecution, um, people's attempts to forcibly assimilate and destroy us throughout the years. So although there's reality to this, 
how do we engage this in a way that doesn't reinforce the idea that like, oh, those sad, miserable Jews, right, who just need Jesus in their lives to be fixed. Um, and one way is to sort of be thinking about Jewish agency, right? The Jews have always had agency in how they live, even if they have lived in very difficult circumstances. This is something that uh, Jewish historiographers engage when they discuss something called the lachrymose um, conception of Jewish history introduced by uh, a Jewish historian named Barron in the, um, I believe the 1960s. And there's ongoing debate about to what extent this story is an accurate representation of Jewish living. And the sort of his, the contemporary Jewish historians really look at that as a yes and, right? That Jews lived and thrived even during some of these periods of extreme turmoil and terror because Jews have this agency in how they make their day-to-day -day decisions um, and Jews have different experiences within these um, times of turmoil. The other thing that is very challenging is that um, looking at Jewish suffering often leaves out a very important piece of like, where did this suffering come from, right? Do we persecute ourselves? No, right? So how do we talk about this um, when in the context of the myth of Christian innocence, right? That nobody did this to us, it just happened because Jews deserve to suffer or are born to suffer. It's their fate to suffer. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna point to my own work here because this is something that I've been exploring as a designer. Rosenstrasse, as Evan mentioned in the introduction, is a game about uh, Jews living in Berlin between 1933 and 1943. And in our design, Mo and I explored a bunch of ways of resisting this flattening of Jewish experience to suffering. One of which is exploring agency that it was actually important to us to recognize that although I know I was just saying Jews have always had agency, there were, there were limits to the agency that Jews had, but also that anyone who was allied to the Jews had, right? So in this case, the non-Jewish spouses of the Jews in our game. So we were able to explore these limits of agency in a way that didn't attribute it just to Jews. We also made a point of introducing joyful moments. So there are scenes where the characters are dealing with extremely difficult and terrible things. Um, the, you know, the, the deportation, deaths of their families and community, uh, just, you know, destruction of their homes. Um, but there are also scenes, for example, at a Passover Seder where a character's children are, are um, trying to get, uh, trying to playfully uh, hold ransom the Afikomen as part, as part of Jewish Seder traditions. And it's sort of a fun intergenerational moment that's joyful. And also when played in the context of 1933 to 1943 Berlin, poignant and full of irony, you know that these parents will not be able to keep their promises to their children. It's joy and sorrow mixed together as a way of addressing this issue of suffering. So the argument that I wanna make, the thing that I think these three games have in common in addressing these problems is that they're approaching things with a Jewish lens, right? And obviously working to be interpretable to outsiders, but they're getting at some of these deeper concepts and these deeper ways that Jewishness is not just belief in God. Jewishness is not just um, eating Jewish food. It is not just suffering, historical suffering, um, but rather it's a ancient and coherent legal, philosophical, intellectual tradition. So I wanna give three examples of ways that Jewishness is different. Um, and 
in particular, I want to start by talking about pleasure. As a game designer, I spend a lot of time thinking about pleasure. And in Judaism, pleasure is good. Pleasure is not sinful. Um, and in fact, not just pleasure in general, but um, uh, including sexual pleasure. So FYI, going to talk about sex for the next two to three minutes. Um, there's a wonderful story in the Talmud where um, Rav Kahana, who was the student of a rabbi who was just known as Rav, he was so famous, he was just like, Rabbi, um, he came in and hid under Rav's bed. Rav is chatting and laughing with his wife, and they're having sex. And uh, Rav Kahana, from under the bed, says, dude, you're... You're you're so horny. You're being you're being lustful. You're having sex with your wife. You're like having fun with her while you're having sex with her. Um, this is this is not cool. Rob says, "What the hell? What are you doing under my bed?" Right? And Kahana says, "No, this is Torah, and I must learn." And the the absolutely radical thing here is that this is where the story ends. In other words, Rav Kahana is saying, sex is holy, and I must understand how to have joyful sex in an appropriate way. Admittedly, hiding under your teacher's bed, not the best way to do it, right? But this story is a, is a um, powerful argument that pleasure is and can be holy. And we actually, on our holidays, right, coming back to this theme, and on Shabbat, which is our holiday that recurs every week, uh, some of the pleasures that Jews are actively encouraged to uh, partake in is good food, right? It's not sinful to enjoy food. Food is wonderful. Drink wine. Have consensual sex. You should wear new clothes when it's time to celebrate. You should rest, take naps. You should learn new things and read books. Uh, you should sing in community. You should uh, have meals with people that you love, right? These are pleasures that are explicitly encouraged and supported both by Jewish law and Jewish communal life. And as a game designer, I often think about how Judaism manages this pleasure with rules. So we actually have rules to rejoice um, that, you know, how you, you celebrate on a holiday, if you can afford it, you should buy new clothes, right? Um, not you must, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a structured way to rejoice. And I think this is really important because how many of you have ever had an afternoon off where you've been like, I should do something fun. I don't know what's fun. I'm just going to you know, feel glum and try to figure out what to do. So these rules that structure rejoicing um, can actually sort of help bring pleasure into time and space and reality, right? There are also rules about refraining. So I've been talking about Passover a bunch, Passover holiday, uh, you don't eat leavened foods, no bread. If you avoid, um, if you sort of uh, keep to the sort of strictest rules, it, it's it's quite difficult to eat delicious food. It's not impossible, but um, after eight days, you are really longing for a piece of pizza, um, which is my traditional end of Passover celebration. And I would argue that these rules about refraining are also a part of, um, uh, uh, of pleasure, that humans are prone to something known as hedonic adaptation. In hedonic adaptation, we get used to what we enjoy. So um, if I had ice cream every day, I would get used to having ice cream every day, and it would bring me less and less pleasure over time. This is true in all kinds of contexts. Um, for example, uh, after a major positive life event, people's happiness within about a year returns to pre-event levels. Um, so the idea of periodically refraining or having structure around the way that you experience these joys and pleasures 
It's not saying they're bad, don't do them, but rather it's thinking about human nature and the way that you can sustain enjoyment over a long period of time. A second thing I want to point to is uh, how Judaism handles conflict. And we have this concept of, in Hebrew, uh, we call it machloket l'shem shemayim. I translated in my own work as holy descent. And uh, holy descent means that it, it's okay to not agree. So in this case, we have a story from the Talmud. Hillel and Shammai, two very famous rabbis, they had different traditions of law, and they argued, right? One said laws like us, the other said laws like us, and a heavenly voice spoke, right? Not something we necessarily take literally, but a heavenly voice spoke. These and these are the words of living God, meaning both of these contradictory ideas can be true. Elu elu divrei Elohim chayi. That is a critical element of Jewish thought, that we are not looking for one single truth, but a multiplicity of truths that are consistent with Jewish thought and Jewish life. However, the heavenly voice goes on to say, but in practice, we follow what Hillel said. So the question was raised, right? If they're both the word of the living God, right? Divrei Elohim Chayi, why, why pick one, right? Why was the halacha established to follow Hillel? What they say is that because the students of Hillel were kind and gracious. In other words, holy descent means that you take the ideas extremely seriously and you also take your interpersonal obligations and your obligations to the truth extremely seriously. That the students of Hillel taught their own ideas and the ideas from the students of Shammai and they showed their respect by teaching Shammai's opinions first. Now, I want to be clear, right? This is, does not, I'm not making an argument that you should take any opinion that anyone has seriously, right? Both Hillel and Shammai are deeply engaged with a shared tradition and body of knowledge and are aiming to understand it, amplify it, and understand how the right way to live. But they can both be right, even if we don't um, actually follow what one of them says in practice. And this relates to a Jewish tradition that we call preserving the minority opinion. That even if we decide that we're not gonna do something or we're not gonna follow someone's opinion, we actually, it is, we, part of the reason we have these like large bodies of text going back over thousands of years is that we value preserving these opinions to study them, but also because they may change as life changes, that there's something that we can draw on to continue being Jewish and engaging with Jewishness as the lived experience of being Jewish changes. The final thing that I want to point to is our attitudes toward life. When I tell people that I grew up as an Orthodox Jew, people often like try to give me this gotcha. Oh, so you wouldn't eat pork if you were dying. And I was like, no, actually I would eat pork long before I was dying, right? That the idea of pikuach nefesh means that above all, above almost all, we are obligated to live, right? That, that being alive is a wonderful thing. And we have an obligation to violate the laws of Judaism when it is necessary to save a life. For example, Jewish doctors drive in cars if they need to go and see a patient on Shabbat. On Yom Kippur, our most serious fast day, uh, if you are unwell, if you are, are pregnant or nursing, if you have an eating disorder, if you're sick, you are not just allowed to eat, you are obligated to eat. And the obligation to care for yourself is something that is deeply rooted in Jewish culture. And it's not an individualistic thing, that these are communal responsibilities where we are obligated not only to preserve our own lives, but also to preserve the lives of other people around us. And I could get into communal responsibilities uh, in Q&A if you're interested, how that actually is implemented, but I see we're getting a little short on time. So I'm just going to point to, you know, 
a game that's specifically designed from this, this idea of he's been honored in Judaism. And in this game, the Society of Rafa, um, you're actually part of a community where your role in the community is to be this guardian of life, guardian of health, along with the other PCs. And so you really get to explore from the inside what these Jewish concepts feel like and understand a different way of seeing the world. All right, so what? And before I get to the so what, I just want to acknowledge that um, giving this talk was risky for me. Um, I could easily have given a talk about my academic research. Um, and instead I've chosen to give a talk about something that I am, this is living work for me. I am, I have been publishing on Jewish games and Jewish HCI, but like I, I, I'm working this out, right? Like, and I'm sharing this with you while it's alive, before it's finished. So that's one kind of risk. But I also want to be very clear that this is being recorded. I don't know who's going to see it. Um, it is very possible that if the wrong person sees this, that I will be targeted for harassment, that I will be targeted, that my family will be targeted as Jews living in Pittsburgh. We're very, very aware that we are findable, that people who want us dead know where we are. And um, I also feel a heavy sense of responsibility that if I've done this wrong, that I'm putting my people in danger, that if you walk all walk away from this talk going, what the hell was she doing? You know, that there's no real Jewish perspective here. Jews are just so self-indulgent that, that those consequences can come back, not just on me, not just on my family, but on my people. But the reason I want to give this talk um, is because I want to end with a, a call to action for this community. And the first thing is that I hope that because you've heard this talk, you will see us. Just see us. Understand Jewishness on Jewish terms instead of seeing us through the eyes of Christian hegemony. And I have some specific recommendations. Um, play Jewish games. I think many of these have been uh, mentioned in chat. Uh, we've got a bunch of role-playing games here. Lost and Found is a very good um, uh, uh, board game by my colleague Owen Gottlieb. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, but there are other things. So first of all, you want to help. Uh, there's Jewish games in development. Play test, right? Uh, I, I I have to say, I did not check if Society Rafa is currently looking for beta testers. I got to beta test and it's incredible. Uh, I'm working on a LARP about uh, Jewish concepts of repentance and atonement. Um, and uh, so that's another way to learn to see Jewishness as Jewish. Um, you could read Jewish books. I'm just recommending two that I think are particularly useful. Here All Along is by uh, Sarah Hurwitz, and she really explores her own journey learning about Judaism, um, a really accessible and really good. Jewish Literacy is more of a reference work um, by Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. And also talk to Jews. If you have Jews in your life, wonderful, you're all set. If you don't have Jews in your life, there's an excellent Facebook group that I'm currently locked out of Facebook, but when I get back on Facebook, I'm a member of a group where non-Jews can ask questions about Judaism. Um, and it's a really good way to try to understand Jewish difference and be able to recognize Judaism and see us and our games for who we are and what we are. The second thing I wanna say is include us. When you're designing for accessibility, consider Jewishness. And I, you note, I don't say Jews because often the price for Jews to have access to game spaces and game design spaces is leaving our Jewishness at the door. So some things to think about, scheduling, you know our major holidays, give you a hint, Hanukkah is not one of them. Make room for Shabbat. Understand that every week we have access issues from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. Um, understand that Jews have different kinds of food restrictions. Support them. 
Um, there's a, I've heard way too many stories about, for example, people putting surprise bacon in things because they think, oh, that would be funny. It's not funny. Please support us in making sure that we can eat in your community. Um, let us, if we were working around some kind of holiday, um, let us sing, let us light candles, let us eat together, make space for us to pass on the traditions and rituals of Jewish life. And um, there's a concept of melacha, right? On Shabbat, on holidays, there are things that many Jews don't do. We may need your help. If there's like an elevator, if there's a room key, if we have to write something on our character sheet, um, if we need to ask for your help with that, your response should not be, as I once had said to me, I don't understand why you're even here. It should be, of course, if you're curious, you can always ask, why, what's up, but just having that attitude of being willing to be supportive and create space for Jewishness in game communities is critical. And finally, I want to say, please fight for us. Help us create a just society that protects us all with Jews included. And I say this for three reasons. First of all, uh, Sedek Sedek Tirdof is a Jewish phrase it means you have to run after justice. Justice is not going to come to you. And Jews, Jews are actually strong allies for social justice. Um, there's a um, PRI, a, a, it's a religious research institute. Unfortunately, they're doing their next study now. I don't have the, the fresh data, but um, Jews are overrepresented in basically activism, social justice, progressive movements, progressive beliefs. Um, if, okay, I'm just gonna say this, I, this is the kind of thing where, where I worry about consequences, but if Christians turned up in the same proportion that Jews do, we'd be living in a very different world. So please include us because we, we do the work. Um, but also include us because Anti-Semitism forms a theoretical core for other forms of bigotry, in particular in America, racism. Um, that uh, how can the groups that are supposed to be on top, right? How can white supremacists possibly be struggling against those they see as lesser? Ah, there's a secret force behind the scenes. It's the Jews. So including Jews in the struggle for social justice, it's not just a non-zero sum game but it actually helps undermine the core theory behind white supremacy and other forms of bigotry. And the reason why I feel like I have to say this out loud is because we live in a culture where overtly or covertly, we are all used to imbibing this notion of a problem. If we just remove the Jews, then we will have a better world. That there are people who literally believe that all it will take to bring about paradise is for all the Jews to die. And whether we like it or not, we are all touched by those ideas. So please, if you know that that's an issue and look for it in your communities and help us be included in the justice and equity that protects us all. I want to close by thanking some of the people who made it possible for me to give this talk. There's a Jewish, uh, there's a, a phrase, I've learned much from my teachers, more from my colleagues, most of all from my students. So I want to thank my teachers, in particular my mother, Phyllis Hammer, who fought for me growing up in a conservative religious community to have access to the same scholarly education that my male peers were getting. Without her, I could not have given this talk today. I wanna thank my colleagues, in particular, Moira Turkington, who called me up and said, do you wanna make a game with me? And before that, it sounds ridiculous, but it never sort of occurred to me that I could be doing this kind of work of making Jewish games, thinking about what Jewish games are from the position that I'm in. It's something that I had always thought would need to be at the side of my life. And she helped me bring it to the center. And finally, I wanna thank my students in particular, my former PhD student, Alexandra Toe, now faculty at Northeastern, she directly inspired this talk um, with work that she is doing on BIPOC joy, 
uh, just published an absolutely incredible award-winning paper at um, Designing Interactive Systems. And I can see, I forgot to paste the link here, but I also see we have an active Discord pasting links for things and I can find it later if need be. Um, but without these three people, this talk would not exist and the work I do in this area would not exist. So thank you all very much. And thank you all for listening. I'm now open for questions. Thank you, Jessica. And, and, and thanks also to uh, the, um, uh, our two interpreters, Cassie and Robert, for uh, for keeping up and and making sure this uh, talk is accessible to audiences both now and in the future. Um, again, as as someone else who is a, a Jewish person in the space, I I feel like yes, bringing up Jewishness is this um, identifier for. Um, you know, targeted harassment, and at the same time, uh, you know, your talk related to Jewish joy is, um, you know, a gift to us all. It gives to give us all courage to to speak up. And, Thank you. Uh, and yeah, and and I and I really appreciate that. Um, I'm I'm gonna run through the Discord to see if there were any questions. There were lots and lots and lots of links, and uh, and and people. Um, uh trying to to figure out um you know how how they can contribute and so let me see if there's other questions per se otherwise uh you know one one question i have is um you know related to uh what again related to my own interests is what is do you see in the secular tradition of judaism and that's you know like Isaiah Berlin, Stanislav Lem, Franz Kafka, right? The, the the folks who are using especially this uh idea of of criticism, of of disagreement, of being uncomfortable um uh in a in a secular tradition and where you see that uh, with respect to your talk. And I think uh this is again something that resonated throughout, but I, I want to be clear on my own case, especially. Uh, where the secular tradition is with respect to the religious tradition, because um, I think a lot of us are grappling with being bad Jews. And then uh, on the on the flip side, we're not bad Jews at all, according to your talk. It's great. It, it makes you feel a lot better about what, what kind of work I do and, and the kind of work I do in, in, in um, the gaming space as well as the academic space. Yeah. So um, I guess the the this is a very Jewish answer, which is that I think that as Jews, one of the things that we need to do is reject this division of the world into secular and religious. That's um, correct. Bruno Latour uh, argues that the modern secular movement is really a Christian movement and that it is essentially Christianity without God. Um, it's structured around Christian values and ideals. Um, it's... Uh, 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 um, reinforces sort of Christian notions, it valorizes Christian holidays, it just takes away God while it's doing it. And I actually think that that's a powerful tool is questioning this divide between religious Jews and secular Jews, religious anything and secular anything, and recognizing that um, we are part of these rich cultures that at least in the case of Judaism, go beyond anything that we would think of as either on the religious side of the divide or on the secular side of the divide. Um, the, uh, the, I think that actually the thing that I find most inspiring is a quote from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who talks about this exact issue, that it's not good Jews and bad Jews, religious Jews and secular Jews, but rather um, Jews who take Judaism seriously. And you might take that seriously by, for example, um, uh, he, he has a story of a woman who comes to him and says, I'm such a bad Jew. Um, I eat bacon for breakfast every Shabbat. And she, he says, you're a wonderful Jew. Look at you observing Shabbat with something that brings you joy, right? That you're, you're, you're living in Jewishness regardless of how you're manifesting it. And I would love to see um, this idea of being seriously and deliberately Jewish across religious, secular, 
different Jewish denominations um, as something that unites us as way in how we live as Jews in the world. Wonderful. I, I've got a question here in the Q&A from Caitlin Heller. It says, some of your talk touched on the relationship between Judaism and nature, and I know some of your work addresses also climate change. Do you have any thoughts about how Judaism can help inform our approaches then to the climate? That is a really good question. Um, one of the things about Judaism that gets erased when it is, when people try to fit it into a Christian mold is that Judaism is a religion about the land, about agriculture, about nature. The example that I'll, I love to give, for example, is that the Jewish day begins at sunset and ends at sunrise, right? That we, the day doesn't start at this arbitrary clock time of midnight, right? It starts when the sun goes down. And um, the Sorry, right, and then, right, the night begins at sundown and night comes first and day. The point being is that it's in tune with these natural rhythms. And I think that that's one thing that the Jewishness can offer to climate work is, re is a model for how do you organize your life in relationship to nature from the way that you tell time, the way the holidays work, um, the, the laws of agriculture, of making sure that everyone has enough to eat, if you happen to be lucky enough to be a landowner, what you're required to leave over for the community. Um, many of these laws have been theoretical for a very long time because for in many countries for thousands of years, Jews were not allowed to own land, but nonetheless, they can provide a model for relationship. The other thing that I think Judaism has to offer work on climate change is actually what I'm talking about in this talk, which is that um, we can have joy in the midst of sorrow and trauma. I think one of the hardest things about dealing with climate change is climate grief, right? How can we deal with the fact that our world is changing and how can we deal with the fact that we, it, as individuals are helpless Right, like none of us, no individual, no one of us is gonna have a big enough impact to actually do something about it. Um, but this idea that like, okay, well, we're still here and we celebrate that. That's something that can be really powerful. As well as this idea that you're not obligated to complete the work. Your job is to show up and do it, right? And showing up, dig where you stand, do what you can. You're not responsible for the outcome. You are only responsible for doing your best. So I think those are some things that Judaism can offer the climate movement.